Hey guys, Daniel here. I'm uh, getting ready to run into the gym, but uh, there's something I want to share with you uh, real quick here. Um, for those of you that don't know, I was hired on at a couple of hospitals in Mesa, Arizona. It's a campus with two hospitals. Um, Mesa is about 30, 40 minutes east of Central Phoenix where I'm based. And these two hospitals are Banner Baywood and Banner Heart Hospital. And I was hired to give uh, Reiki treatments to patients and staff. And I can't tell you, it's so very exciting to be out there and quite the privilege. It's exciting for somebody that does what I do to be working in a prestigious medical institution like a Banner Hospital, not one, but just, but two. But also it's a privilege because we're making history out there in that, um, you know, we're changing the paradigm and we're creating a whole new medical model. And this is the way it should be, friends. See, people should have access to the latest advances in modern medicine, as well as know about and have access to the small handful of medically, of, excuse me, scientifically proven to be effective alternative therapies. And some that have been with us, you know, for thousands of years. And moving forward, we're gonna see more and more of this type of collaboration with healers like myself and the medical community. It's inevitable. Um, and raking hospitals, it's not something new, but it's an inevitable in that, especially after 2020, you know, people are looking for more. They're searching beyond their HMOs and their PPOs um, for alternative options out there. And they are out there. And also the medical community itself is becoming more open, more enlightened. And as long as the therapy is scientifically proven to be effective, you know, they're on board. Now, I've been thinking about this, the collaboration right, of healers like myself in the medical community. And I've been going through my notes, uh, my notes and files for the past few years of people I've been working with, have worked with, and I came across a case, a situation that I wanna share with you because it was, and I forgot all about this, and it was actually the first time I did get to collaborate with a medical professional. And what happened was um, a friend of mine referred a patient to me. Now this friend, we're gonna call him Jay, and Jay is a clinical psychologist. Now, Jay is not any ordinary therapist, all right? He's got his, you know, doctor's degrees and lots of master's degrees, and he's authored several books. And uh, Jay specializes in addiction, but here locally and at the state level, Jay is a pillar in that community. And um, Jay and I go way back several decades, and he's very familiar with my work because he's been by more than a few times um, to, to uh, get some healing sessions. So what happened was, was this, um, J this was the spring of 2018 and Jay called me up out of the blue and he said, Hey Dan, listen, I have this patient. She's 43 years old and a little over a year ago, her daughter was killed by a hit and run driver. And since then she's come unglued. Okay, she's bouncing off the walls, she's squirrely as F, and she can't string together two sentences. Now, Dan, I've tried. I've been working with her for almost two months now. Like I said, I've tried. I cannot help her with the tools I have, but I know that you can help her with the tools that you have. Could we please get together? And I said, absolutely, Jay, you know I'm in, but what happens if the board catches wind of this? And Jay, he shot back, so Jay. Jay goes, fuck the board. I'll just keep two separate files on her. Now, referring to the board, now Jay making this referral, okay, he was not only putting his license on the line, but he was putting his entire career on the line as well. And, uh, you know, you just don't make referrals like this outside of licensed, degreed healthcare professionals. But um, Jay being familiar with my work, um, he, he took a chance. So we made an appointment for them to come by. Her name was Karen. And they came by a couple weeks later and uh, they came in, introductions were made and they sat down. And Karen, you know, she was looking at me quite skeptically. And I said, what? What's going on, honey? If you have something to say, please get it off your chest. You're not gonna offend me. And she snapped back with, Jay tells me you don't even have kids, have children. How do you know what I'm going through? How can you possibly help me? Valid point, right? 
And I said, you know what? You're right. I have no idea what it's like to lose a child. And suddenly. But I'll tell you, I do know what it's like to lose the most important person in your world. And suddenly at that. So I told her my story. When I lost my partner unexpectedly. And when I was done, she thought about it. And she kind of nodded to herself. Okay, we can do this. So um, Jay excused himself and we got to work. And Karen, she was indeed squirrely as F. And her mind was just racing and racing and racing. And she couldn't string together two sentences. And what that was about, that was a defense mechanism, okay, that her brain came up with. Because as long as her mind was racing, she couldn't talk about, let alone feel, embrace the full gravity of the loss of losing her daughter. Okay, it was still out there somewhere. I mean, she was feeling it, of course, but, but not to the extent she would have been. And this defense mechanism, you know, that our brains and our bodies come up with sometime, sometimes, um, it's not unusual. There is a situation called soul loss. And soul loss occurs when somebody experiences a trauma that is so horrific that what happens is literally a piece splits off and it flees and it hides somewhere, but it takes with it partial, if not full, the, the partial, if not full emotional fallout of that traumatic situation, in addition to partial, if not complete memory of the situation altogether. And this happens, especially if the victim is young, you know, people with gaps in their memory, more times than not, there's a traumatic event involved in facilitating that gap. So um, people that have experienced soul loss, they have characteristics in common, you know, especially if it happened when they were young, you know, they're, they're always depressed. They're kind of dragging through life, going through the motions. There's a dark cloud over them. And especially if sexual assault was involved, you know, Many of them are overweight, addiction issues everywhere. And there's a list of about 10 characteristics. And as shamans, what we can do to help these people, there's something called soul retrieval. Now soul retrieval, it's a somewhat of an involved process. And, and we retrieve the missing pieces through a practice, a tradition called journeying, journeying. And the way that process works is the shaman will reach what Sandra Ingerman calls the shamanic state of consciousness via drumming. You listen to drumming and you zone out more or less and you reach this very deep state of meditation, a theta state. And then eventually you find yourself on the other side of the veil. And everyone's place that they show up at is different. I show up at, um, it's a huge dark space with a light shining down, at the center of the light, there's one of those old fashioned wells where there's a five foot, four or five foot high cylindrical brick wall around it with a little roof on top and the bucket and the handle. Yeah, there. And there I'm always met by two of my guides, two of my, my spirit helpers. Um, one is a black wolf with a white, white chest and the other, is this beautiful maiden with raven hair in a white shimmering dress. <clears throat> and then when you arrive at the other side, from there you go to either the upper world, the middle world, or the lower world. You know, um, when I journey, it's to find information or for, for soul retrieval. And you go to one of those three worlds, you go do what you have to do, and then you come back and you bring the missing piece back and put it into the client. Now, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, just for, for brevity's sake, I'm gonna keep it short. But um, journeying, uh, you know, Alice in Wonderland, right? When Alice goes through that hole in the ground next to the tree, that is a classic example of a shamanic journey, classic. She tumbles down the hole and all this crazy stuff happens. Yeah, okay, um, yeah, like I said, that's a classic example. And um, before we bring the piece back, you know, 
like I said, there's a lot involved. I have to make sure the client or patient has the coping skills necessary to deal with the, uh, the emotional fallout of that situation because all that's coming back and the memory of it too. So um, when I, find, when I um, encounter a client or a patient that has experienced some sort of horrific trauma, traumatic event, I always refer that person to a therapist that specializes in EMDR therapy, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. It's a relatively new modality that was put together for people experiencing PTSD. Okay, and this is what these therapists specialize in. Like I said, I can do it, but um, I would rather somebody more qualified handle that sort of situation because um, I've heard stories of, you know, of shamans bringing back the missing pieces and the person just not having what it takes to, to deal with it all, the memory and the emotional fallout. So um, I have a therapist that I use for my own personal EMDR therapy, and I always refer people to, to her. But now back to Karen. Luckily, Karen was not experiencing soul loss, okay? And um, Karen came for a total of eight visits. Like I said, she was bouncing off the walls, and I know, very clinical, very clinical expressions. But um, with each subsequent visit, she got quieter and more grounded and more centered and was indeed able to start talking about what was going on. And as I was working with her, Jay was still working with her also. So we were comparing notes the whole time. And by it was the fourth or fifth visit, um, she brought her tarot cards with her. Um, something Karen did was, um, or does is, she goes to psychic fairs and does readings using her tarot cards. She brought her cards with her and she gave me a reading that was spot on. And uh, when she was done, I asked her, you know, how does it feel? How does it feel to be reconnecting with yourself? And she got very emotional. And uh, it, it was a wonderful moment because she was, you know, following the breadcrumbs and she was getting her power back. And after the eighth visit, she sent me a text. She said, Daniel, thank you for everything. I've got my confidence back. I feel strong again. And it's time to get back to life. And that was the last time I heard from her. And um, yeah, it is what it is. But uh, the point was, this was the first time I got to collaborate with a medical professional. And uh, it was... It was heavy and it was rewarding. And um, please know guys that the work that I do, the healing work that I do, when people feel better, heal from whatever is their challenges may be, please know it's not about me, okay? It's not about me. All I do is suit up and show up, that's it. The rest, you know, it's about God, okay? Not me, not me, okay? So enough out of me today. As always, friends, never forget that you, yeah, I'm talking to you. You are loved. All right. Take care. Walk in peace. Till next time.